where they can go racing is to justify the development on the turbocharged engine. Racing cars in the 30s were supercharged. Fuel was literally pumped or charged into the engines to make them go faster. The supercharger was mechanically driven from the engine, so it used up some of the engine's valuable energy for pumping. A turbocharger is different. A turbine is set inside the exhaust pipe. The hot exhaust gas spins the turbine, which is directly connected to another turbine set in the fuel inlet tract. This pumps air and fuel into the engine. The beauty of the system is that it uses waste energy, exhaust energy, to pump the fuel. It's a technique that has been pioneered in Formula One by the Renault team within the current regulations. These allow an engine of one and a half liters to be turbocharged and raced against conventional three-litre engines. There's no law that says that a one-and-a-half-litre turbocharged engine is equivalent to a three-litre normally aspirated engine. The problem is that in order to get more power from a one-and-a-half-litre turbocharged engine than a three-litre normally aspirated, um, there is no problem achieving it, but you have to use quite high boost pressures uh, and to uh, compress air that rapidly to as high a pressure as necessary, you are, you are heating the air considerably just through the, the compression of the air, uh, and you then have to remove considerable amounts of heat from the air before it goes into the engine. Um, and really, the engine is, is a big thermal problem uh, in getting the heat away from all the components in the engines quickly enough so that they don't actually melt. It, does the engine, it doesn't actually melt the inside of the engine. But despite the inherent unreliability of turbos, the prospect of massive power is leading other teams to adopt the idea. The reliability of the Williams team has stemmed mainly from their determination to stay with the well-tried three-litre Cosworth engine. Despite first appearances, it's a very simple engine, a V8 with two banks of four cylinders. It has four valves per cylinder, 32 in all, and these are driven by four camshafts two for each bank of cylinders. The camshafts are turned from the crankshaft by gears that run up the front of the engine to the tops of the cylinders. For 12 years, it's been one of the great racing engines. Simple, tough and powerful. Originally built in 1967 for Colin Chapman's Lotus 49. This rare film of the engine being mounted into the then new Lotus shows Chapman and engineer Dick Scammell Lovely. at work. Well, Dick, now we get to the interesting bit. Um, we built the engine onto the car, as you can see. Yes. And now uh, we built the rest of the suspension on the back of the engine because the engine itself is forming part of the structure of the car. Right. And, of course, uh, it holds it all together. Now, if we can get that mounted on there, mm -hmm. get those picking up on those bolts. It was this innovation of making the engine part of the chassis that was the really clever part. It's an idea that's been copied by all subsequent race cars. Get it all mounted up, get it down because we want to be testing At its first outing at Zandvoort for the 67 Dutch Grand Prix, the young Jim Clark hadn't even seen the car before he drove it. Today, the engine is more powerful, but manufacturing has remained unchanged. It's made from 3,550 individual components, which are milled, ground, cast and forged in Cosworth's Northampton factory. And all the parts are hand-finished.
these gears will form part of the camshaft drive. Final assembly of the engine is unchanged too. George Duckett built the very first Cosworth for Lotus. This latest is for Williams, and the main tools of the trade are still the knowing eye and finger, and a mental note of the myriad little parts that make the engine go. I think you, you think of numbers the whole time, because you, you pick up five bearings and you, you know that they've got to number from one to five. Um, you know there's ten washers, so you always pick up ten washers. And if you take them off, you, you know that uh, you've got to have ten washers there when you pick them up again. Otherwise, someone, one of them might be inside the engine. That's the way I do it, anyway. Often, only two weeks between races. Although the teams have got more than one engine per car, uh, quite often they do need their engines rather quickly. They come in after a race and they want them for the next race. But uh, that isn't really enough time. It takes between five and six working days to completely strip and rebuild an engine. You can't really do it any quicker. If you hurry, you always do things wrong. Actually, what I'm doing now is feel. You can feel it going down. You can't describe something like that, really. You don't know what experience you've got until you start doing it, until you start thinking about it. At least I don't. These crucial little nuts and bolts hold together some staggering dynamic forces. Well, the thing that's impressive, apart from anything else in an engine, is that each individual cylinder manages to go suck, squeeze, bang, blow 92 times per second. Keith Duckworth, designer of the Cosworth. The sparks required at 11,000 RPM are 733 per second. The piston uh, weighs five and a quarter tons at 11,000 RPM every time it stops or you, the conrod stops it from going out through the cylinder head on the exhaust stroke then there is a load of five and a quarter tons on the big end. 